Hello, this is a recording for Biology 1407. It's the third recording for Unit 1, Evolution and the History of Life on Earth. We are taking a look at Chapter 20, Phylogenies and the History of Life, from the OpenStax textbook. We understand from biological investigation that there is a terrific amount of information having to do with structure and organization, metabolic pathways, the means in which energy is transferred from one location to another, and the way that information is stored um, that clearly links all life together. Um, these features are really the same except for relatively minor differences kind of at the end of the way these processes work that are distinct to different groups of organisms. But the basic ideas and the basic tools, the basic uh, molecular tools are the same for all life on Earth. So what this uh, again um, gives us is um, a terrific amount of biochemical support for the idea that all life on Earth is related um, in an essential fashion. And of course the idea the conceptual framework of that relationship is evolution through natural selection um, from common ancestors. All right. <clears throat> as far as what's on Earth today, uh, cataloged, meaning that we have, you know, careful uh, um, adjudicated information or, you know, properly uh, 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 um, referenced and cited and evidence-based material, we have about up to 2.3 million species, depending on definitions. There are people that put lots and lots of, they're called lumpers, they put lots of closely related species together in just one species, and there are splitters who consider, you know, highly, highly separated populations of the same species as effectively being different species. So that's why there's some range on this number right here. There's also some uncertainty about, you know, some members of this list of things. And in Importantly, we by no means have exhausted the total diversity of life on Earth. It is um, um, easily um, substantially more than that, and five million uh, different species of everything out there um, seems to be a very conservative number. But there's a huge amount of diversity on life of life on Earth. Additionally, counting the number of individuals um, is really, really, really difficult. <laughs> Uh, there are 7 billion uh, humans on Earth, um, a lot of other life forms, um, I think a trillion, especially including prokaryotes. Prokaryotes is a very small number, so I kind of debate this out of our textbook, but there it is. Um, information that allows us to link life on Earth together, uh, sources of information. We've just talked about biomolecular uh, material, DNA, RNA, and all of that sort of stuff. Additionally, when we look at the um, development of organisms as they go through their stages of development, this embryological applies primarily to animals. We do use the word embryophyte when referring to plants because there is a traditional sort of embryo version of a plant inside a seed. Um, or in the case of non-seed plants, you know, the early form of the developing young plant. Um, but their development is very different from animals in the sense that the pattern is not set early on. The pattern continues replicating all the way through the organism's life. So embryological development is particularly a hallmark of animal development. Behavior psychology, anatomy, that's the morphology, and of course the huge amount of information constantly being exposed through the fossil record. <clears throat> all right. What we want to talk about in here for a while is how we organize that um, diversity of life, however many millions of species there are and however many uh, trillions of individual living organisms there are. And we have a number of different um, means. Um, what we want to talk about in this chapter is a system called, is a organizing system called systematics, which groups organisms based on their hypothesized evolutionary relationships. Remember, all evolutionary relationships that we talk about are hypotheses, except for some very, very recent, you know, <laughs> data, um, because most of these events, most of the speciation events, happened far back in time, long before we were around, or certainly before we were um, 
um, recording any information on this subject. Um, there is, you know, some new data coming, particularly out of prokary out of the prokaryotic world, where we're seeing, um, you know, new groups arising in real time right now. Now that we've been paying attention um, for about 150 years uh, systematically, and also have developed such fabulous investigative tools in the last century, really, um, you know, the ability to record evolutionary events in real time is starting to pile up, you know, uh, providing um, live experimental evidence supporting what we've hypothesized as having happened for all life on Earth. One of the best systematic systems is called a phylogeny, which, you know, so this represents a phylogeny right here. And as it says, it is a hypothesis, since we don't know the evolutionary history of all of these things from firsthand experience, we have to um, decipher the evolutionary uh, relationships based on these sorts of data that we have available. And that uh, that that hypothesis is really reserved, <laughs> reserved, referred to as a phylogeny, a phylogeny or a phylogenetic tree. And this is a tree from a um, systematics uh, point of view in that from a common origin, it branches off to represent the relationship between different groups of organisms here. Here's that same information um, illustrated in two different forms, and they have their different uses. For y'all in introductory biology, this kind of modeling right here of evolutionary trees is going to be far more typical. And it might be vertically arranged like this, or as we'll see in um, upcoming images, horizontally arranged like this. Uh, but that's the typical thing, and it is what's called a rooted tree, which means there is a point of origin, and that's hypothesized to be the ancestral origin of all of these things. And, you know, there's no specific scale of years back here, uh, but this is, you know, the idea here is this is back in time and this is moving forward in time until we get out to the ends. And of course, in this branch right here, all of these things, these groups exist today. So all of them are now, right, the ends of all of these branches. And working our way back through the branches here, we have these two groups converge somewhere back in time. And so prior to that node, to that branching point, let's just take this one here because it's clearer. Um, we have a common ancestor that was the common ancestor of all of this stuff. What did it look like? One of these things or perhaps different. It totally depends. It just depends on the particular details. There's no one exact pattern. The idea here is that all species are evolving over time. Some evolve substantially so that they look and function quite, quite differently from what their ancestors look like. And we would say they evolved into a new species if we want. It's something that you can't test because, you know, back in time, in the past and now, you can't connect those two together. Um, or, you know, the space species may still be around and everything else is a modification of that existing ancient species that's been around for an awful lot of time. A lot of times we don't know. The fossil record helps us, you know, decipher a lot of these relationships, though. Anyway, that's a rooted tree, and that's our typical version that we're going to use right there. Um, the unrooted doesn't hypothesize what's ancestral to what. It just shows how different groups, once they were established, continued branching in their own various ways. I'm sorry, I had to cough there. An important assumption in all of these is that if we look at close enough detail, all phylogenies of all life will appear as branches where, you know, the ancestral group carries on and some novelty, you know, typically a genetic novelty that has a um, anatomical, a, 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 a phenotypical difference that you can see your point to or you know that determines how they function or what they can breathe or whatever you know but a genetically based innovation distinguishes the new group right here in this case color-coded red um, to represent eukaryotic cells as opposed to the ancestral prokaryotic um, archaeobacterial lineage right here and so the idea is that the old things carried on it doesn't mean they didn't change on their own they've all continued changing but there was a major major novelty in one of the two branches that distinguishes the branch from everything else and that's the idea of these phylogenetic trees inevitably and again we'll primarily look at rooted ones which imply an ancestor to everything terms that you have just got to get down so a taxa 
single uh, uh, plural, one taxon, many taxa. This is a Latin conjugation um, uh, uh, idea. Anyway, one taxon would be human, you know, human beings. <clears throat> uh, one taxon, a taxa, you, you know, would be several, would be primates. That includes, you know, all of the different species of primates. Okay, a clade is any branch or lineage. All right, so this is a clade, this is a clade right here. And a clade consists of an ancestor, one or more branching points, and the descendant groups that are around today. And that's what we mean by a clade. And the branching point, the node, we use this in botany to represent where branches come out of uh, uh, the central stem of a plant. That term is also used when tree building. You know, so we have a node and a branch right here. And the idea is that the branches always lead to two possibilities. And the, the hypothesis is if we have enough enough data we can resolve any multiple branching thing into a series of two branching events but we just need more data <clears throat> so the node in any clade is the most common ancestor of everybody in that clade all right and all of this could be a clade we could just have this clade that is a b c d right here we could just have the smaller clade of a b or the clade d c and every time we say that clade it includes its most recent common ancestor whatever the ancestor of c and d was this creature right here <clears throat> some additional terms that come up um, two members of the same clade are called sister taxa so kind of like sister chromatids back from biology 1406, same term, uh, same idea, different subject, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so this is a phylogenetic tree, and we might as well go ahead and start internalizing this one because we're going to use it in the next unit when we look at the uh, diversity and function of animals. <clears throat> so the evolution of the vertebrate group is based on a number of events which we have strong evidence from multiple lineages to arrange in this sort of uh, sequence right here. So some animals that didn't have a vertebral column but did have a dorsal neural tube, uh, somites, which means regular blocks of muscle running down the length of the body uh, and regular segments of that body as it were, you know, grouped together, but with that dorsal nerve cord are called chordates and that would be the ancestor of us all right an ancestor at a certain point back in time there's earlier ancestors further back than that as well but those chordates um still exist today or descendants of them again this is not the thing that was the ancestor of everybody else it is a descendant of that ancestor but it retains a lot of the features that allow us to hypothesize this is likely what the ancestor of everybody else looked like. It would have been an animal kind of like this. And that's a lancet. It is a chordate uh, that doesn't have a um, bony skeleton in its back. It doesn't have a skull. It doesn't have a jaw. It lacks a whole lot of features, but if we look at it, we're going to think, fish? Weird, primitive, strange fish? And that's kind of what you're getting at right here. Do they have a vertebral column? Well, one of these groups, somewhere along the way, for whatever genetic reasons, developed structure of cartilaginous skeleton surrounding its neural tube. That's the, you know, that's the appearance of vertebrates. So, you know, the presence of a vertebral column, the answer, yes. Well, now that's vertebrates. So this is chordates. This is vertebrates. Everybody's got, you know, a vertebral column. They've got lots of other features as well, but they're all vertebrates. So we are vertebrates as well as chordates. Do we have a hinged jaw? Yes. All right. Well, <laughs> that's what separates all the rest of the fish from lampreys, which is a jawless sort of fish. Same thing for the egg surrounded by a protective membrane. These guys have eggs. These guys have eggs. These guys have eggs. But all of these eggs are a cell surrounded by a thick layer of jelly, then exposed to the water that it's in. All of these things have eggs that are surrounded by a tough membrane. All right. In the case of the frog, flexible. In the case of the lizard, uh, surrounded by a hard shell outside of that. And in the case of the rabbit, that membrane-bound egg implants in the uh, placenta or implants in the uterine lining, forms a placenta, and carries on developing. But it's surrounded by that membrane all the way to the end, the amnion. 
um, hair, etc., etc. So this is a ladder-like, as you see, horizontal phylogenetic tree, and importantly, <clears throat> It um, gives us some major evolutionary transitions that distinguish one group of vertebrates and their ancestors from each other. Lancet is not a vertebrate. It is a, it is a chordate. It's got a notochord, and it's got a um, dorsal nerve cord, but it does not have vertebra. And this is rooted. There's the root, you know. Is it the ultimate root? No. we got to go all the way back in time to find the ultimate root, but we've got to go back through a lot of stuff. All right. <clears throat> so one of the things is that, you know, as it says right here, you know, closely related taxa oftentimes look very similarly to each other. So the two taxa in this group that are most closely related to each other are rabbits and lizards. They have gone, undergone, you know, very, very different evolutionary trajectories based on very different selection criteria that has led in both cases to very well adapted animals that, you know, are abundant, speciose, and live in lots of places. And even though they're closely related to each other, they're pretty darn different from each other. Um, whereas the lancet, the lamprey, and the fish, there's an awful lot of superficial similarities here, the lancet certainly being the odd one out without a skull even. Um, but there's a lot that you'll recognize as being the same across these, even though this represents far more time <laughs> and far, far more distant you know, divisions in, in the groups here than that between lizards and rabbits here most recently. And of course, we're going back in time as we go back. This happened before this happened, before this happened, this and this, all right? So, unless specified, and we will see trees where it is specified, but normally the branches, the length doesn't represent anything specific. It is implicit that we're going back in time as we go back here, but there's no measure of how much time. You will see uh, phylogenetic trees where there is a time axis. It's actually on here, and those are very, very useful as well, but it's not automatic unless it's stated. All right. Now, taxonomy on the other hand, is the traditional version of classifying things, the one that you're all already familiar with. And so in the Linnaean system, we have, you know, uh, actually Linnaeus did not use domains. He started at kingdoms uh, because they didn't know anything about this back when he started his work. So they added a new uh, division above. But domain, kingdom, phylum, class, etc., 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 all the way down. These are ways of categorizing, categorizing things. And there is no ancestral species just called eukarya. Um, now we understand that there would be an ancestral single-celled eukaryotic organism living in the oceans that is, you know, the earliest eukaryotic ancestor of a dog right here. But this just represents a classifying term, an organizing principle. Same for the rest of these right here. Whereas in this, this represents an actual animal. As I said earlier, it probably would have looked an awful lot like the lancet, at least close on to the split point right here. And if we go back in time, it was changing, but it represents an actual living thing. All of these lines represent something that has a descendant that's still around today, unless it's an extinct, you know, branch. This doesn't have that. All right. <clears throat> Nonetheless, we still use it because this is familiar and has utility. We need to or organize the huge amount of information. Uh, think about that office with <laughs> at least 2.1 million files in it that all have to be classified somehow. And that's why we use this taxonomic system from Linnaeus um, as our usual way of classifying and organizing information um, about species so that we can retrieve it later. And of course, one of the key features of the taxonomic Linnaean taxonomic taxonomic system is this binomial name. Every species gets a binomial, which is its genus plus its specific species epithet. All right, and y'all all know yours. It's Homo sapiens. Um, if you're writing it by hand, like, you know, in your notebook or on something that you're going to turn in for a grade, you're always going to underline the term, and the genus is always capitalized. The species is always lowercase. That's a convention. Um, if you're typing it, we'll always italicize, and the capitalization is still the same right here. <clears throat> okay. The higher taxonomic names are capitalized, but they're not italicized. So homidae, primates, mammalia, etc., etc. Everything's capitalized except the specific epithet, and the genus and epithet are going to be italicized or underlined depending on what mode you're using. Handwritten, typed. All right. <clears throat> the idea, and I talked about this in our lecture a little bit, um, that uh, for um, 
phylogenetic classification is that we're working with homologous evolutionary stru you know, uh, structures right here. So we know that there's a relationship between bats and birds because their wings you know, have a bone structure that has a terrific amount of common features right here, and they track back all the way to the um, forelimb of an ancestor, um, the front limbs of an ancestor that was walking around on the ground that is the ancestor of birds and is the ancestor of bats. Now, as I discussed in our lecture, this is a bit of a confusing situation right here because the wing of a bird and the wing of a bat are also analogous because they aren't both versions of a pre-existing wing. They are both versions of a pre-existing limb called a front leg. So the fact that they've been modified into a flying, something to support flight, the wing is an analogous evolutionary situation, and that's parallel evolution towards similar shape, similar structure, to satisfy the same thing. The only way to fly around in the air is to get a large surface area thing, and it's got to be symmetrical, there's got to be left and right, and it's got to be actuated, <laughs> and the forelimb is, you know, has been used by every vertebrate that's taken this leap, so to speak. All right. And we're familiar with this idea of homologous characters from uh, our previous work. So here's four limbs of four different major groups of vertebrates. Whales, um, birds right here. Uh, not yet, did I say mammals? I meant vertebrates. Whales, which are a mammal, but a vertebrate anyway. Another vertebrate, a bird, which is not a mammal. It's actually a dinosaur, if you will. A dog, another mammal, and a human, a mammal right here. Um, a brachiating, which means move through trees. A walking, a flying, and a swimming limb but they all have the same pattern. All right. And here's true analogy, where there is no evolutionary relationship between the two wings. So remember, I cautioned you here, these wings represent, if we look far enough back in time, homology. They're both derived from this sort of limb right here, a walking front limb of something. All right. But they are also separate versions, separate solutions to the same problem, how to fly, and they share a huge amount of characteristics because really it's the only way to make this thing work in these animals. And of course, in both cases, they've used the front limb as the modified limb, you know, to give them the surface area to fly. All right. These, however, have no evolutionary relationship, except that there is a common ancestor of both of these organisms right here. But the common ancestor of this damsel, or sorry, this dragonfly, and um, damselflies look similar, but the wings are paired at rest, um, you know, folded behind them. Um, and this bird right here, uh, their common ancestor was a snail-like thing that had no limbs at all, let alone four limbs and rear limbs. So that means these wings are most truly analogous structures. There's a lot of analogy, you know, pairs to the left and the right, you know, same position relatively in the body. Um, there's got to be a lot that's the same because, you know, there's only so many ways to get up into the air and move around using muscle power, and a wing is that tool. All right, so this is a case of convergent evolution where we've created these analogous characters from utterly different origins. <clears throat> so, you know, here's the difference between classification and phylogeny. If we look at these things and we want to classify them, there's a bunch of reasons why you might put these together. Marine organisms, terrestrial organism. But, you know, if you look closely, you know this is a dolphin. It is a mammal. This is a shark. It is a cartilaginous fish. A um, um, I can't think of the name right now, but anyway, cartilaginous fish. And this is a cheetah. It's a mammal again. All right. And so we know that phylogenetically, we're going to put the cheetah and the dolphin together. And the dolphin is a descendant of a terrestrial animal that walked on four legs. And these are modified front legs. Uh, the modified back legs have been lost and the tail has been modified into this big. There's a pelvis inside there, but no legs sticking out. And it's really much more closely related to this thing than it is to this thing, which looks superficially like it and is not the ancestor of either of these, but a descendant of a shared ancestor of these guys, the ancestor of of mammals and fish was a fish. <laughs> All right, <laughs> some sort of fish. Um, 
but you get the idea right here. So here's the evolutionary reversal. You know, aquatic organisms moved onto land, and then some terrestrial organisms moved back into the water for reasons that work. Basically, there was opportunity to take advantage of there. When the marine reptiles were all eliminated 65 million years ago, that opened the door for marine mammals, uh, and they started taking over those uh, habitats over time. So, convergent evolution and evolutionary reversal. Um, make things harder, make things take more work, all right? Um, here's another example. Legness, leglessness in worms, leglessness in snakes. Well, the worms never had legs. <laughs> they always have been leg-free, all right? Um, their marine ancestors may have had gills, extensions on either side that are not legs, but extensions that increased surface area, and that was their breathing technique, and they lost those when they moved in onto land because it's easier to get, if you can avoid drying out, you get a lot more oxygen in the air than you do in water. So you need suddenly less respiratory structure when you're on land than you do equivalently in water or less efficiency. So those worms could give up their things that gave them oxygen ability, uh, absorbing abilities in the water. And of course, snakes are descended, we now know uh, very clearly, from reptiles, a type of thing we would have called a lizard. Um, it's a very different way to get to the same shape. All right. Molecular systematics. Um, DNA um, and RNA and proteins, but primarily DNA, um, allows us to test a lot of our hypotheses about relatedness of organisms and sometimes the nuclear material does not match what we have established over the last 150 hard years of trying to classify things using all these other sources of information but more often than not the dna at least roundly supports you know what we figured out from these things every once in a while we find that there's something different and we misinterpreted this information and in inevitably the dna rna information ends up um becoming the most well supported and most um trusted uh, bit of information all right. Um, you can have convergence in DNA, uh, but it is less likely than it is in all of these other features, uh, you know, that organisms exhibit um, to adapt to a particular situation. And that is because there's multiple ways to get a particular phenotype. And the idea that random mutations in DNA will lead to the exact same mutations in a whole bunch of genes to get the exact same phenotypic structure is really, really low probability. There's a much higher probability that we'll have two different unique sequences, sets of mutations of DNA that lead to changes in proteins, that lead to changes in phenotype, that look and function really similar to each other to solve the same problem in the same environment. That's much more likely, and that's in, in consistently what we find. So we're realizing that the DNA data that we can explore so well these days is really our ultimate determiner of these relationships. <clears throat> Why do we care? <laughs> well, curiosity. But one of the interesting things is, you know, if we under have a phylogenetic relationship understood amongst things, even when they're highly you know, uh, different from each other, one of the places this has really proved to be very useful um, is, you know, in Practical stuff like, uh, you know, drug drug uh, uh, development. If you're not familiar with it, most of the um, drugs that we use are derived from some plant somewhere. Less frequently, and we shouldn't have insulin here because it's the least... <laughs> oh, well, there's reasons why this would be an example here. But think of all the plant-based drugs. Aspirin, uh, willow bark, okay? That's where that comes from originally, etc., etc. Well, if we know that these plants are all part of the same group phylogenetically, we know that they're genetically related to each other, and if we find something really useful in one, members of, one member of that species that maybe is a really rare tree that lives only in certain select bits of a tropical rainforest, but we find out there's a temporary bush <laughs> that's actually closely related but looks utterly different than that tree back in say you know the um, uh, Amazon um, we might be you know be able to find a much more useful and easy plant to cultivate to extract a particular drug and this has happened again and again and again phylogenies make that sort of work much easier and there's any number of other examples that kind of get us the same knowledge all right
All right. So cladistics is the process of building phylogenetic trees using data. And again, the data, many sources of data, and classically all of this has been used these days more and more we just go straight to the nuclear and use DNA information or RNA or proteins um, as our molecular uh, means of creating these phylogenetic trees and that process is called cladistics. Cladistics is the process of making those phylogenetic trees <clears throat> and the result is a cladogram. So here we've got another vertical one. Um, it's not rooted, although implicitly there's going to be your root coming out. And it's the same information we looked at a few pages ago. Let's see if we can find it. This right here, same information, just arranged in a slightly different way. All right. And here this allows us, you know, just to point out a couple of different uh, clades. So this whole clade here is the vertebrata. And of course, the lancet is excluded. That would be the outgroup, the thing that these guys are all descended from. Another, you know, clade that we can put inside here is the amniota. We could include lamphreys and these guys together. And that would be the nathostomes, things with a jaw. <laughs> and then these are the amniotes and these are the mammals, etc., etc. All right. And each of those, you know, clades is nested within a bigger clade, nested within a bigger clade, nested within a bigger clade. But the objective in phylogenetics and in cladistics is to build clades that are monophyletic. All right. So we'll give you an example of what that means. Monophyletic just means that everybody all the branches from a common point right here, everything downstream of that is grouped together and included in that grouping. Okay, that might seem pretty um, obvious. What else? How else would I do it? Well, let's look at some examples. All right. <clears throat> so here's some examples uh, where we have monophyletic clades and then others where we don't have monophyletic clades. Okay. So here we've got a um, clade that includes animals, fungi, and plants. And what's unique about these is that they all appear to be uh, descended from um, some common ancestors. This is going to actually include a whole lot of algae and a whole lot of other things as well um, in this grouping right here. But there's a common ancestry for all of these. And these, of course, are the three big multicellular forms of life on Earth. Flagellates is a um, group of single-celled organisms, Euglena being one of them, um, that shows up down here. And that is a clade with just one branch in this picture. Um, what's not shown here is that the flagellates is plural. There's actually lots and lots of species. So if we wanted to, we could add a huge amount of detail on here to get the entire family tree of flagellates, but it'd be a very crowded picture. So for simplicity's sake, if we're just interested in the relationship between flagellates and the rest of these major groups of eukaryotic cells, we're just going to put them in one branch and call it flagellates. Okay. Now here's situations where we don't have monophyletics. You know, we could classify flagellates and ciliates together, um, but they are not the only descendants of this common ancestor. There's a whole bunch of others that we're excluding for whatever reason. So this is not a monophyletic grouping, taking ciliates and flagellates and putting them together for some reason. And same thing over here. Plants and animals, you could put them together into a group because they're obligately multicellular which means if you take their cells apart, they die, whereas fungi are not. If you tear fungi apart, you'll destroy a mushroom, but the fungus is really the filaments in the ground down below the mushroom. That's the bulk of the fungus. The mushroom's just the equivalent of a flower. Um, but fungi are excluded because they're not obligately multicellular in the same way that plants or animals are. Um, well, that's not a monophyletic group, so we can't really put them together in a group like that. It doesn't make sense. All right, because we're excluding fungi, we're just putting these together based on some shared character. All right. <clears throat> so we know, um, going back and looking at chapter 18, one of the uh, uh, you know key ideas um, from chapter 18 is that we have descent with modification on all of these lines, every branch represents, you know, a line of descent. There may be lots of modification. There may be very little. There's no one rule. <laughs> Any combination of mutations, adaptations, and changes that allows a 
group of replicating organisms to continue existing on Earth has been successful. Sometimes that means very little change. It's worked for two billion years. Why change it now? Other times, lots of change has led to something that can take advantage of a new environment that its ancestors couldn't. And because of that, they're still around today, but there's something unique and different. There's no one answer. It's just this happens. All right. So again, you know, genetic, uh, random genetic mutations can, you know, lead to phenotypic, new phenotypic traits, which may become prevalent in a group if they're selected for, or they become rare if they're selected against, or they follow Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium rules if they're neutral. Uh, but, you know, we have the potential for change over time. Um, if we have a whole lot of organisms that have that trait, you know, um, from this point on, you know, then we consider that to be a clade. That is a new clade. A new clade. All right. Some considerations right here. All right, one of the really important ideas to keep in mind in phylogenetics and evolution itself is that there is no natural implicit goal of perfection, just modification of existing structures that lend improvements to that structure. And so here's one of the classics that's often illustrated. Now the eye is a very, very complicated organ. And eyes vision has originated, um, an image forming eye has evolved multiple times independently in the world of life out there. So you've got image forming eyes that have appeared possibly twice in arthropods, two different ways in which we've gotten to a picture forming eye in arthropods. Uh, that's represented by the chelicerates, chil uh, uh, spiders and all of their kin. Um, and then the myriapods and insects, um, which have a different sort of eye. So spiders and, ins and bees have radically different eyes, for example. Um, and then um, they arose in vertebrates. There's one, you know, evolutionary event that we know of that led to um, an image-forming eye in vertebrates, and the human eye would be an example of that. And then in the world of mollusks, we also have an image-forming eye, and this is an octopus eye right here. And you'll see, unlike the insect eyes, which are anatomically very, very different, although optics <laughs> requires that they have certain features in common, um, they're anatomically very different from a spider or an insect eye. Um, and these look really similar to each other. So they've got an iris made out of muscle. They've got a lens in the front, a lens in the front, iris made out of muscle, iris made out of muscle. Sorry, I said lens. I meant the cornea in front. An adjustable lens in the middle right here, a focusing thing that can be whose shape can be changed with muscles here and here. And then a, a neural layer of photoreceptors, cells that have chemicals that respond to light and cause those cells to send nerve signals, neural signals, back to a brain. So we have that layer back here. They look really, really similar, but an incredibly important difference is in the vertebrate eye, the photoreceptors, the cells, are behind the neurons, the nerve fibers that lead back to the brain. So light must pass through all these structures, pass through the neurons, or the axons of these neurons, and then finally hit the photoreceptors themselves back here, which means some of the light gets caught by all this nervous tissue and doesn't get to the photo detecting cells and convert it into information. This is an imperfect eye. And additionally, where all those nerves have to leave the eye, we can't have any photoreceptors. And here's the blank spot, the uh, blind spot in our eye, which is if it was directly at back right here, we wouldn't see anything in the center of our field of view. So you can see evolutionarily why the blind spot's off to one side so that the fovea centralis, this bit right here, we get a pretty clear picture. The mollusk guy first that first appears in clams, <laughs> and it's you know it's extreme uh, 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 evolutionary apogee or peak is the octopus or the squid eye, has that one detail different. The photoreceptors are in front of the neurons, so here the photoreceptors are directly exposed to light, and there is no blind spot, even though the nerve, the optic nerve, could come off in roughly the same position because the neurons come off the back of the photodetecting cells. 
Technically, if you were engineering it, this is a better eye. It doesn't have a blind spot. It doesn't have neurons in the way of light hitting photoreceptors. This is a less good eye. This one works like a champ because a huge number of evolutionary adaptations have minimized the negative impacts of this thing, but we can never get this eye to be that eye because we'd have to undo all of this to turn it inside out, which only worked when they were primitive eyes. The inside out versions of these two eyes, this version and this version, in the most primitive, oh, there's some light over there, that's it, that's all the eye does, both work just as well. And as they've gotten better and better and better, the limitations of the vertebrate eye have become increasingly apparent while the, you know, while those limitations do not manifest nearly so uh, dramatically in the molluscan eye right here. And that's what we mean by not leading to perfection. So, you know, the best eyes of this model right here are generally accepted to be in birds of prey, eagles, falcons, and stuff like that. And they have exquisite vision, but they still have a blind spot and they still have some of these limitations. In other words, they could have even better eyes if they could have this, but they don't, and they can't. That'll never happen. Um, a little bit about shared um, ancestral characters. You know, so if we look at rabbits and lizards and fish and lancets, something that they all have and share is a, um, and ignore this little arrow right here, they have a nautocord, which is a wand of cartilage. Think of like a fishing pole, but made out of cartilage. And immediately above that, closer to the surface of the back, a hollow neural tube. There's a bunch of other things, but those are all shared ancestral characters. So because of that, we can put lancets and everybody else into a shared group, a clade called chordates, because they all have that. Similarly, excluding lancets, all the rest of these have a shared ancestral character of that vertebral column. This yes here applies to the vertebral column. This yes applies to the jaw, this one to the legs, this one to the amnion, this one to the hair. So, you know, that makes all of these guys chordate, uh, sorry, uh, vertebrates within the larger clade chordates. This clade is chordates. This clade, excluding the lancets, is vertebrates, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, we can have a shared derived character. So the shared ancestral character is the anapomorphy. The proper term for that is an anapomorphy, you know, that unites all the members of a clade. All right. The shared derived characters, the synapomorphies, are the things that distinguish one member of a clade from other members of that clade. So the synapomorphy that distinguishes rabbits from everybody else right here is the fact that they have hair. That's their unique, there's others, you know, mammary glands and a bunch of other things as well. Um, but that's one of the synapomorphies that's used in this classification process, the presence of hair or fur. Okay. Um, choosing the right, right relationship. All right. So here's a really important idea. In the absence of any other information, when attempting to build a phylogenetic tree, phylogenetic tree relating a bunch of things, so the act of building a cladogram, we want to use a rule called parsimony or maximum parsimony. And the idea there is that we use the simplest possible um, explanation to explain what we see today. So we've got these organisms right here. One organism has, you know, uh, you know, a hollow nerve cord. Number two also has the hollow nerve cord. A represents hollow nerve cord for all of them. Okay. B represents um, having a um, backbone, vertebral column surrounding that hollow, you know, ho surrounding that hollow nerve co column. And so, you know, uh, group it, species two and species three both have that one. And then finally, we've got these unique characters, uh, the presence of feathers, I'm just making these up as I go, and the presence of hair on these right here. Well, here's one explanation that we could have of how we would get, you know, to that sort of sequence here, you know, that um, A 
was the ancestor of all of these, you know, something involving trade A, and it's still present in all three of these. And then there was a branching right here that led to another group, no other changes, and only after we branched again to create these two branches right here, did we have B appear as an evolutionary innovation in both of these, and then C on this line and D on this line. That could very well be true. There's no rule that says it's not. But in the absence of any evidence to allow us to choose um, this one over this one, Maximum parsimony asks us to use this one because it required less evolutionary things to occur. One appearance of A, one appearance of B, which is now shared amongst all these descendants right here, and then C, unique, you know, animals with feathers, birds, and D, unique animals with hair, mammals, okay? That's the simpler answer, and in the absence of any other information, that's what we pick. Now, every once in a while, we find this is not right, and in fact, a more complicated evolutionary story is, in fact, the more accurate one based on the evidence that we can collect. But <laughs> this has proved extraordinarily useful. Using the rule of parsimony generally leads us in the right direction. Occasionally not, but generally so. You might have also encountered this idea in science from another perspective. It's called Occam's razor. And the idea is that you remove, Occam's razor is an intellectual tool, remove the more complicated, fantastical explanations for something and the really improbable things until what's left must be, <laughs> you know, a mass that contains the true answer to the question. And that's the our ideal of parsing away. To pair or to pair is to cut things away. You've heard of a paring knife in the kitchen. That's to cut away material from a fruit typically. And that's kind of the origin of this word right here. To cut and, you know, cut away from until you get to the core or the center of something. Okay. So Darwin first started thinking about this. He didn't leave much of a visual clue back in the old day, I think, which I talked to you all about in a previous recording. Um, most textbooks and most science books written by anybody were all words and no pictures because pictures are really, really hard to recreate. So they're always terribly expensive. Only recently has that changed. Okay. Um, but he did think in the form of trees, right? And um, there's some interesting details right here. So, you know, back in Darwin's day, for instance, fungi and plants were thought to be really, really closely related. All right. These days, we now know that fungi and animals are actually really closely related of those three multicellular uh, eukaryotic groups, and um, plants are the odd one out. All right. Fungi and animals uh, both lack chloroplasts because they've never had them. They're both heterotrophs. They get their energy, their food from you know the world around them. Um, and there's a terrific number of similarities in their cellular structure and how their cells function. The final organisms are as different from each other as could possibly be. And it's easy to you know confuse a mushroom with a plant if you don't know anything about either of them because they're sitting still and popping out of the ground, of course. Right. Um, but a fungus is basically an animal inside its food. It grows into its food. It releases its digestive enzymes onto its food in the outside world. An animal is something that surrounds its food, swallows its food, and digests digestive enzymes onto the food inside a cavity inside it. Those are the huge differences. Similarly, you know, we used to think of birds and reptiles and mammals as being three distinct separate groups of vertebrates, right? class aves, class mammalia, and class uh, uh, reptilia. That doesn't work. It's evolutionarily totally incorrect because we now know for a fact, not a fact, but it's inconceivable that there's any other answer at this point. Uh, the, the, the support is so extraordinary um, that birds are really um, a group of dinosaurs, theropod dinosaurs, so distantly related to Allosaurus and Tyrannosaurus, descendants of small relatives of these guys. Um, and, you know, so they're just descendants wandering around today, right? Dinosaurs, crocs, and birds are all more closely related to each other Um, than they are to modern reptiles, you know, like uh, like um, rattlesnakes, rattlesnakes, and you know, uh, Komodo dragons, and all of those guys. All right, uh, some important ideas right here. Um, we're going to use two different species concepts when talking about phylogenies. Um, what is a f species? You know, it might seem fairly obvious: cheetah, cat, wheat you know, whatever. Um, but 
you know, most of the things we call a species that we normally think of um, are eukaryotes that reproduce sexually. And that's the biological species concept. So if you've got members of a population that trade gametes back and forth with each other, all right, interbreeding population, um, and that don't share gametes with another population somewhere else, reproductively isolated, that is defined as a biological species. All right. So it doesn't really work for things that um, uh, reproduce asexually. All right. It doesn't work for bacteria. So those have they we sometimes refer to them as biological species because we've identified that, you know, this cloud of them is all descended from a relatively recent shared ancestor. But basically, uh, asexually reproducing things are just endlessly branching trees, diversifying steadily and continuously because you know, unless there's some means of homogenizing them back. And so truly asexual organisms that have no other means of sharing genetic material really don't count as species because they're all kind of going their own direction down their own branch, accumulating mutations and changes over time. And that's what's referred to as the phylogenetic species concept. So that works well for things that um, uh, don't sexually reproduce. We'll go ahead and call them phylogenetic species concepts. All right. biological species concept, phylogenetic species concept. So depending on what, you know, what your questions are in biology would determine which of those is the more useful concept for you. There's also morphological species concepts that is the only thing you can use for fossils. <laughs> what else is there but the anatomy you're looking at? And we attempt to put everything that looks like a Tyrannosaur together in one thing called Tyrannosaurus rex. After a lot of work, we found out there's a bunch of different Tyrannosaurs, yada, yada, yada. All right. Here's a big problem, but also an extraordinary and exquisite complication that makes biology really, really interesting. And that is um, horizontal gene transfer, HGT, but horizontal gene transfer. When you hand copies of your chromosomes and genes to your children, that's called uh, vertical a gene transfer from generation to generation to generation, you know, going down time, which is usually, you know, going up the tree um, or, you know, whatever. But anyway, going forward in time. Horizontal gene, gene transfer is the exchange of genetic material between, so that it can be used between two currently living organisms, swapping of that material, but however it gets from one to another. All right. And oftentimes it can be between unrelated species. There's also horizontal gene transfer amongst species members of a species. We'll see that in just a second. But it also happens amongst unrelated species, which makes genetics much more complicated. The transposons that you looked at are very, very similar to viruses. And just like transposons can copy a gene and move that copy of a gene to another location somewhere else in an organism's genome, viruses can copy a gene when they infect one cell, and if that virus is capable of infecting cells of another species, swine flu, avian flu are both examples of this, they can, when they infect cells of the new species, they can bring a gene from the old species into the new species, which is a radical thing. It is now widely understood, even in our own human genome, um, since we've been humans, and certainly before, you know, before uh, primates showed up, but, you know, the ancestors of humans today, that, you know, this sort of horizontal gene transfer is a non-trivial part of the heritage that's led to us today. In other words, we have genes in us, vertebrates have genes in them, that clearly belong in bacteria or come from viruses or come from another group of animals, all right? And, you know, it takes a long time to, you know, show you the proof and explain these. But, you know, a terrific amount of research has shown that this is um, very, very likely. Again, we can't prove it. It's all stuff that happened in the past, but the pattern strongly supports that interpretation. So here's some examples of horizontal gene, uh, gene transfer. Um, Bacteria have three means of sharing uh, genetic material. One is called transformation, and bacteria in aquatic settings routinely take in DNA 
that usually when they're under stress, when the cells are under stress, they take in DNA from the outside environment through accident or design. It's hard to tell, but it happens. And it can be a foreign piece of DNA from anything, from a human cell, from an algal cell, from a fish, from another bacterium, from an archaeobacterium. It doesn't matter. But, you know, occasionally that bit of DNA is brought in and occasionally it gets incorporated into the genome of the host cell. And now we've got new genetic powers. This cell is new now acquired some new capabilities to make new proteins that might give it new capabilities. And that's really the adaptive value of transformation. Cells under stress, they're dying, they're unable to reproduce very rapidly because they're not working well in their environment, reach blindly for more genetic material and use it. And if it works, great, they survive and they're selected for. Um, similarly, viruses, this is a phage virus right here, as they infect one cell after another, and you know, even viruses that just infect members of the same species move genetic material amongst members of those species. And so we can get duplication events of, gel of you know, genes that way and transfer of genes. And then finally, there's conjugation, where a lot of different types of bacteria, including E. coli, can build a hollow protein tube between them, conjugation pilus, pilus, P-I-L-U-S, and there it is right there, and um, run off a copy of, you know, some bit of DNA that they have, usually on an accessory chromosome called a plasmid, and introduce that to the other cell. So it has nothing to do with reproduction, although it's sometimes called bacterial sex, but it has everything to do with sharing some genetic information. And oftentimes the proliferation of antibiotic resistant genes through a population of bacteria is accomplished this way. And then of course by reproduction. If this cell reproduces and is carrying this plasmid with antibiotic resistant genes, the two cells that are a result of course will carry a copy of it, but here they can transfer it to another already existing cell. Very interesting. So those are all examples of horizontal gene transfer that are not involved in reproduction. We also see it in eukaryotic organisms. Um, a famous example is that there are all kinds of species of aphids that produce chemicals that are based on genes that come from a host plant they're tightly associated with. Uh, the genes are from the plant, you know, by looking at the, you know, by comparing different, you know, species of aphids from different areas and looking at their genetics and then looking at the genetics of the host plants, we find that these guys will have genes in them that only occur in this plant. These guys have genes in them that only occur in this plant, and there's no crossover between the two. There's regular aphid genes. That's the stuff that's common to both of these. Um, but there's an example, and, you know, uh, aphids are particularly um, famous for, you know, having this particular feature right here. Here's some other examples right here. Transposons, transferring between right and millet. Uh, fungi that take up a taxol, a cancer-preventing uh, substance from yew trees right here. Um, yeah, and this carotenoid enzyme transferred fun from fungi to aphid. Um, I said plants. I meant the fungus inhabiting the aphid right here, uh, inf inhabiting the plant, the fungus, the Anyway, there's plenty of evidence of this sort of stuff going on in eukaryotes, and there's probably a lot more that we just don't know about yet. All right. One of the really important uh, events of um, horizontal gene transfer um, that we hypothesize um, is the fusion of an archaeobacterial and a gram-positive bacteria to form this gram-negative bacteria right here. So modern gram-negative bacteria are actually the result, this is a, a, an increasingly supported hypothesis, um, of a fusion of two you know, primitive types of bacteria from two different domains, domain archaeobacteria and domain eubacteria to form the new gram-negative bacteria. Gram positive, gram negative, all right? So that gram negatives are really a hybrid of two different bacteria. And, you know, the fact that they've got two membranes kind of suggests something interesting like that happened. Even more solidly supported is the idea that modern eukaryotic cells are the result of the fusion of, one, of two or more prokaryotic cells, or perhaps the very first eukaryotic cell, which was to say a large predatory cell, and it has, you know, um, uh, um, 
a hodgepodge of different signals in its genetic material, as it says right here, informational genes from archaebacteria, operational genes, the information storing genes versus um, expressed um, regulatory genes um, from bacteria that are all present in the nucleus right here. And then, of course, also these other bi bacteria living inside them, the mitochondria, which are um, a type of uh, gram-negative bacterium. And the chloroplasts, uh, not in this, this is an animal cell right here, but if it was a plant cell, chloroplasts, which are a modified um, 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 uh, blue-green algae, a uh, cyanobacterium, you know, photosynthetic bacterium. And in those cases, we see the genome of the alpha bacterium, the, the, the mitochondria, some of the genes that would have been present in that true, you know, free living thing that we would call it a mitochondrion. Some of those genes are now in the nucleus of the host cells. And so these have really stripped down genes. Same thing for chloroplasts and those cells that have chloroplasts. And so that's a case of, you know, fusion, genome fusion to form the eukaryote. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the eukaryotic cell. So the hypothesis is that the earliest, you know, ancestor of the um, eukaryotic cell was a predatory, unprotected, large prokaryotic cell. Right, it had a nuclear, you know, containing area right here, and it's predatory in the sense that it could swallow, it could invaginate. Here's a little um, vacuole being formed. It could swallow smaller bacterial particles, pinch them off, and put them in a little bubble of membrane inside. If you have a cell wall, that can't be done. So this is a non-protected carnivorous or predatory um, bacterial cell that lives off of other bacteria, any other, whatever it can get that it can metabolize really, but assumably other cells primarily. primarily. And we fold in the outer membrane to create pockets where those cells are held and stored and digested. And that that process has been modified, modified to create this interior network of channels and paths and pipes that eventually has been organized into the nuclear membrane with the uh, 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 endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus and all of these other structures emanating around it. Lots and lots of compartmentalized membrane-bound regions. And then we've had these symbiotic events where bacteria were incorporated into them, probably as food. This still happens today. Uh, we have cells that ingest, including in us, we have diseases that are caused by when our cells ingest a bacterium that normally they would metabolize and destroy. Um, they can't, and the bacteria lives inside a compartment inside the host cell and causes disease, tuberculosis, for instance. Um, there's any number of bacterial infections in us and in any number of, you know, organisms out there where the bacteria succeed in living in a capsule inside the host organism. And that's the assumed ancestry of mitochondria and then later cyanobacteria in modern eukaryotes. Um, this happened early on in the eukaryotic lineage and leads to all current eukaryotes. They all have mitochondria. And then a branch, a separate clade, somewhere down the line after, you know, there was a branch going off one direction, another branch, so here's a clade right here, had a second endosymbiotic event where they took in these photosynthetic bacteria and, again, couldn't digest them, couldn't eat them, but they were maintained internally. And what was a parasitic relationship finally changed into a mutualistic relationship. Same thing with the mitochondria right here. Mitochondria gets... Uh, lots of oxygen and sugar and produces bucket loads of ATP as a result. Chlorophasts, of course, if you provide them with CO2 and sunlight and water, they produce sugars and um, etc. etc. A couple of final little ideas right here. So just like this confuses the situation, you know, so a eukaryotic cell is really the combination of a terrific amount of symbiotic, endosymbiotic events and mixing of genomes. So if you want to untangle the eukaryotic genome, it suddenly branches out to many, many previous origins, which is not a single point of origin. But in fact, three branches lead to the eukaryotic cell. Certainly three branches lead to the modern eukaryotic plant cell. You know, the evolution of the eukaryotic cell itself, the evolution of the aerobic eukaryotic cell, the presence of mitochondria, and then the evolution of the eukaryotic aerobic autotrophic cell, the modern plant cell and algal cell. 
And so that's what we're getting at right here. That's the situation, you know. So here we have plants and algae, and they are the results of the evolution of this ancestral eukaryotic cell, the endosymbiosis of mitochondria. So that's true for all current eukaryotes. There's a couple of weird ones that don't have mitochondria. I think two, two clades, two species have been discovered um, out of, you know, hundreds of thousands or that do, <laughs> millions, I'm sorry, that do have uh, mitochondria. So there is a couple. Uh, so mitochondria are kind of a, you know, definitive character of eukaryotes. But notice chloroplasts showed up much more recently in time. We're going forward in time right here and are present only, um, you know, uh, in the in this drawing is not so good right here it should be the branch should be connecting just directly to plants and algae bypassing animals and fungi right here and the same for these other groups you know there's you know if this happened to create us it's probably happened a lot in these other simpler eukary uh, prokaryotic cells the archaeobacteria and the uh, eubacteria and that's the web of life and so the idea here is that a certain amount of order has come out of a real free-for-all of sharing and mixing and matching genetic material over evolutionary history most of this would have been pretty far back in time and is happening less now than it used to another variation on that same idea is the ring of life and that you know, the idea here is that the very earliest life on Earth, there really wasn't one. There was really just one species. It was a whole bunch of bacteria that all did an awful lot of this one way or another. And so they were all sharing genetic material, which if they share genetic material, uh, technically <laughs> they're all one biological species is the idea. If there's a lot of genetic material being shared amongst all of them, you know, at a high enough level. And so that's the idea of what this ring of life represents right here just this unified pool of shared resources, bacteria, shared genetic tools, bacteria, of which at least, you know, three relatively large stable groups that reduced the genetic sharing quite a bit have arisen out of them, the archaeobacteria, the eukarya, and the uh, 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 eubacteria. And in this case, you know, so uh, eukaryotes and archaeobacteria aren't closely related to each other or aren't any more closely related to each other than they are to bacteria. So these guys don't come off as a single branch and then branch, which is what we're looking at right here, where archaeobacteria went off in their own direction and eukaryotes are a distinct evolutionary innovation of the archaeobacterial limit, uh, lineage. There's an awful lot of support for this. This solves a lot of the problems that are present in that other hypothesis, but then this introduces new problems. So we don't have an absolute answer, because of course we're talking about stuff that happened billions of years ago. Certainly this ring would be 3.7 billion years ago, roughly 3.5 to 3.67 billion years ago, uh, when this ring was in existence. And, you know, uh, it's hard to tell. But it's a hypothesis that, that's out there and gets a fair amount of interesting support. All right. Um, the last things we want to look at, let me pull them up right here. All right, we do want to take a look at the um, uh, geological record for just a little bit. Let me adjust my screen here. If I can fit this a little better. Okay, yeah. Um, so this is the clock model of the history of life on Earth. And so, you know, 24 hour or sorry, 12 hour or 24 hour clock if you're military, whatever worked for you. Um, but this is the beginning right here. And then we come all the way around to midnight, you know, the beginning of the next day. And that's all of, you know, the history of life on Earth and just allows us to kind of compartmentalize it and, you know, organize it a bit. So what we know is that the beginning um, based on geological data is about 4.6, 4.7 billion years ago. Formation of the Earth um, and the solar system. Um, the sun would have started forming first with an accretion disk around it. A local uh, dense, you know, increased density regions would have been the seeds of many, many planets, probably dozens or hundreds of planetoids. A terrifically long period of awful collisions and heavy bombardment and all of that stuff, which really winnowed down the number of planets to the current nine, you know, somewhere along the way right here with some spectacular events, you know, along the way. And anyway, after the period of, of heavy bombardment of life right here, um, we've got a planet that's whose surface is cool enough and stable enough um, that it can preserve sedimentary details and, you know, uh, 
sedimentary strata. And as soon as that starts appearing, after about 3.8 million years ago, we start seeing fossil evidence of life. You know, initially it's fairly hard and arguable, you know, really stern, um, not, you know, not really given to enthusiasm about ideas. Scientists are going, nah, 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 life wasn't around that far back in time. You know, you don't have any really absolute rock solid fossils that nobody can argue with until we get somewhere around here. Yeah, there's, so there's a bunch of arguing, but nobody doubts that somewhere in the world of science, nobody doubts that somewhere along the way here, life originated. And if we find fossil evidence, even if it's vague, going back this far, it could potentially pushes that time even further back, although it's hard to square away life on Earth with the heavy bombardment period. So, But anyway, after about 4 billion years, we've got life on Earth. Within about 3.5 billion years ago, so sorry, within about a billion years of the formation of the Earth, um, we have geological evidence of photosynthesis, all right? Some of this is, it, there's, there's a bunch of chemical evidence which appears very, very weakly here, but as we get to layers that are more recent, you know, 3 billion years ago, 2.5 billion years ago, we start seeing really, really substantial geological evidence for an extremely, for a dramatic increase in the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. And the thing is, oxygen in the atmosphere is the result of photosynthesis, of splitting water and releasing oxygen as a gas. The chemical processes on Earth will take oxygen as a molecule and instantly bind it to stuff like rust. Or, you know, <laughs> it will be bound up with carbon to make CO2, or it'll be bound up with hydrogen to make water. It won't exist as molecular oxygen. It's too unstable. It's too reactive. So the fact that there's lots of it in the atmosphere means there had to have been life on Earth. And by two and a half billion years, ago, it's indisputable, certainly really by three billion years ago, it's indisputable that there was life on Earth because there's chemical evidence of large amounts of oxygen accumulating in the atmosphere. Well, once we reached a point where, um, and so that's prokaryotic life, you know, we've got it, fossil evidence of life somewhere back here, probably heterotrophic life initially, there's some reasons why that would work, and then later on photosynthetic life, able to make its own organic molecules, the original heterotrophic uh, life right here was using organic molecules that are produced abiotically, um, you know, through abiotic processes. Uh, especially early in the you know history of life on Earth, there are a lot of areas where theoretically the conditions to make organic molecules from inorganic molecules without life prevailed. Uh, certainly, bombardment from space with you know amino acid uh, uh, rich you know uh, space material like uh, carbonaceous chondrites and stuff like that would have supported life back then. But eventually, they became so abundant that um, they had to start making their own food or all go extinct, basically, or you know have their numbers cut way back down. So anyway, photosynthesis shows up somewhere along the way here, and so now we've got heterotrophic and autotrophic bacteria, and of course they're still here today, doing a fine job and representing the bulk of all life on Earth and the the bulk of all changes to the surface. Um, about two billion years ago, plus or minus, we have the first evidence of eukaryotic cells showing up, the dark blue right here, and that's that endosymbiotic event I was telling you about earlier. So from about two billion years ago going forward, we have increasing fossil evidence of eukaryotic cells. And then as we see back here, um, about 1.3, 1.4 billion years ago, we have the first eukaryotic, uh, sorry, the mul first multicellular cells. We have some fossils right here that are almost unequivocally embryos of multicellular things. They probably weren't super complicated, but they were multicellular because we have fossil embryos going back in time back here. Um, think of the morula or the uh, cleavage stage of uh, development. If you're familiar with those terms, we'll see them in our next unit. Um, that's what we have fossils of back here. So multicellular life by 1.3 billion years ago. Um, we had um, a number of ice ages, you know, snowball earth back here, another snowball earth back here. The earth basically froze over. There was a huge regression of the diversity and the distribution of life on earth but once everything melted we had a great big boom and much much life spreading out all over the place so the cambrian explosion is an example of that um, about 800 million years ago we start you know having the first fossil evidence of animals and by 530 million years ago the cambrian explosion it's an adaptive radiation that kind of explosion you know a whole bunch of species appearing where none were before um, you know, shows us we have multicellular life and animals now on Earth. Um, the first vertebrates and land animals, as it says right here, 
and land plants, sorry, land plants first showing up right here, um, vertebrates and an, uh, first uh, animals on land right after plants. We had animals visiting land beforehand, but if there's nothing to eat, they're not going to stay up there. Once there's food, they stayed. Okay. And then, you know, much more recently, mammals, dinosaurs, etc., 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 you know, in the last little region. We also have names for these regions. The period of heavy bombardment is called the Hadean, as in Hades, as in hell. <laughs> um, and then from 3.8 to about 2.5 billion years ago, the Archaean era. Archae is in the Archae bacteria, the ancient ones. And then the Proterozoic. This is the first proto-animals. Proterozoic means proto-animal. And, you know, during the Proterozoic, the animals show up in the uh, fossil record eventually. And there's a bunch of hard work, you know, eukaryotic cells, multicellular eukaryotes, and then finally plants and animals. And that's the Proterozoic. And then we have the, um, we have the uh, Mesozoic. Sorry, and then we divide the more recent time from 550 million years ago, roughly, to the present into three regions. The Paleozoic, this means prototype animals, this means ancient animals, and it is ancient animals. Most of the stuff you're not so familiar with from your imagery. When you think of, you know, most people think of ancient animals, they're going to pop up a dinosaur in their head. Well, that happens in the Mesozoic, the middle period of life, um, from 251 million to 65 million years ago. 540 is the beginning of the Paleozoic, 250 the beginning of the Mesozoic, 65 million years. Most people kind of know this date. Dinosaurs went extinct, big thing hit Earth. 65 million years to now is the Cenozoic. We assume there was a big extinction event right here, right before photosynthesis, when the food ran out. We know for a fact, uh, well, there's a lot of support for the fact that there would have been a pretty big extinction of event here during this snowball period right here. Um, probably some others along here. Certainly another big extinction event during this snowball Earth right here. Um, extinctions predating the 530 million years uh, ago. Uh, Cambrian, exp Cambrian explosion. Extinction event. And then each one of these lines right here represents a major extinction so 542 million years ago, big extinction event. Out of that arose most modern animal life, you know, forms of them. Weird, but recognizable. 250 million years ago was a huge disaster, the worst extinction event on Earth, probably, um, in the sense that the Earth was populated by a lot more complex stuff by now. Things went so bad, the great majority of everything went extinct. And then again, from that ast that cometary or asteroid impact in the Yucatan, 65 million years ago, this the great extinction event of 65 million years ago. There's a couple of other big ones noted in here. One, two more here, uh, one more right here, uh, to give you all of your extinctions. All right. Um, here's another way of representing all of that time. Um, we are... Uh, Go, starting back here, here's the Hadean, here's the Archaean, here's the Proterozoic, and then here's the Phanerozoic. So the Phanerozoic is all of this, all of this, right? So this first thing here gives us the biggest chunks of our whale. Then we take the Phanerozoic to 540 million years ago, Cambrian explosion, Cambrian explosion, and break it up, spread it out right here. And we've got the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. All right, age of dinosaurs, age of more ancient life, fish, everything, uh, Cenozoic, you know, everything since the great dinosaur, you know, extinction. And then we take the Cenozoic and we expand it out to make the Paleocene, the Eocene, the Oligocene, and the Neogene right here. All right. And then the Pliocene and the Pleistocene, the present right here, just this last little bit. And we've got years, you know, so we're starting 65 million years ago. Here's 5.3 million years ago. This is the age of, you know, primates show, primates actually started way back here, but primates that we would recognize as primates start appearing during this period here, these last 65 million years ago, and most importantly, about the last 40 million years. The lineage that leads to apes starts about 10 million years ago, so right about somewhere in here. And, you know, uh, humanoids start showing up just in this last little nugget um, in the Pleistocene, 11 million years. Sorry, 11,000, uh, sorry, um, you know, uh, yeah, five to six million years ago, the beginning of the 
Pilocene, and then here's the Pleistocene, and then of course much more recent age. Um, the last 10,000 years are considered the, from here forward, uh, the time of um, um, history. History starts in the uh, Pleistocene. You know, the first hint, hints of human culture, saving of information in any form, agriculture, and all of that stuff, is about 10,000 years ago through to the present now. Or this tiny little dot right here. A little bit about geological time. And that completes this recording.